Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is a very challenging and very thought-provoking one entitled, God's Mission, My Mission. And this is lesson number 12 in that series and for December 23 of 2023, entitled, Esther and Mordecai. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty clear what that's going to be about. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we have come once again to talk about your word, to try to expand as far as possible the meanings and to understand them and share them with those who will be listening in. Forgive us where we may have failed to understand. May we bring the clear meanings as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> The Book of Esther is one of only two books in the Bible named after women. The Book of Esther was also quite remarkable in that it does not mention prayer or the name of God. Chapter 1 of Esther tells us that Queen Vashti was banished from the throne because she refused to dance and appear before a group of drunken men. And uh, I won't have put Myra on the spot yet right now, but. Uh, I'm inclined to think you'd rather have your daughter do what Vashti did than what Esther did, but I'm not sure that Esther had any choice in the matter. So, Then some of those men suggested to the king that he hold a beauty contest and pick out the new queen that he liked best. Among those chosen for the contest was Esther, the cousin and adopted daughter of Mordecai. First question, big question. Do you think Esther had any choice and the events of the story so far. Ladies, this is your chance to speak up. Not in those times. Not in those times, huh? None of us have the privilege of living in a country where all the rules are just what we Adventists would like. Wouldn't it be nice if Sabbath observance was the law of the land? I don't know if it would be. There are some countries Depending where it's close to that. Mm -hmm. Maybe for another day it is that. Yeah. I don't know if that would be the, a good thing. We noticed in the Bible that a number of very important characters lived and worked in environments were not conducive to their religion. Can you name some? Some obvious ones are Daniel and Esther, and we could go on. The three worthies, so forth. But they claim um, so many people have failed to follow faithfully the rules of their religion. But they claim to believe that Jesus himself quoted those words from Isaiah 29, 13. Jim? The Lord said, These people claim to worship me, but their words are meaningless, and their hearts are somewhere else. Their religion is nothing but human rules and traditions which they have simply memorized from the American Bible Society. Good news translation. Okay. Think of the stories of Joseph and Daniel and our study for this week, Esther. Daniel and his three friends were members of the royal family in Jerusalem. As far as we know, they were brought up following the guidance of Scripture. As we know from Daniel 1, when they got to Babylon, they specifically requested that they not violate their rules for eating and drinking. What do you think the other young men were eating while Daniel and his three friends ate vegetables? Did they eat together? Did Daniel and his friends get teased about their diet? <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> you think so? Uh, we don't know for sure that they ate together, but it's likely. And now, what was Nebuchadnezzar's goal in bringing them there? Do you remember? It's to unify the empire, wasn't it? Yeah, he was trying to get people who would represent the Babylonian religion and and culture and so forth, back to their own people. That was the idea, to have a link to the people back in Jerusalem. So I suppose that that would be part of the reason why he would say, let's, let's recognize their, their ideas, their culture, and so forth. Let's not stress them too much, or there might be a problem. Maybe, I'm just guessing. After Daniel and his three friends had done very well in school and had been promoted to high positions in the government, there's the story of the golden statue as recorded in Daniel 3. Jennifer? Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. King Nebuchadnezzar had a gold statue made. 
27 meters high and nearly three meters wide. And okay, for those who aren't so familiar with the metric system, that would be about 90 feet high and, and nine feet wide, oh, wow. more or less. And he had it set up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then the king gave orders for all his officials to come together the princes, governors, lieutenant governors, commissioners, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other officials of the provinces. They were to attend the dedication of the statue which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. When all these officials gathered for the dedication and stood in front of the statue, a herald announced in a loud voice, people of all nations, races, and languages, you will hear the sound of the trumpets, followed by the playing of oboes, lyres, zithers, and harps, and then all the other instruments will join in. As soon as the music starts, you are to bow down and worship the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Anyone who does not bow down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. And so, as soon as they heard the sound of the instruments, the people of all the nations, races, and languages bowed down and worshipped the gold statue which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up in the Good News Bible. Okay, now. We, we traditionally think of this as a statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Yes. Do we have direct evidence of that no. in the Bible? No. Okay. It may have been a gold statue of one of what he pictured his God possible. Um, now, the question that's a little more tricky, how many Jews bowed down out there in that crowd? Well, were King Zedekiah and King Jehoiachin both, both at the dedication of that golden statue? From the SDA Bible commentary, once he, that is Zedekiah, sent envoys to, the, to Babylonia, presumably with tribute and assurances of his loyalty to Nebuchadnezzar. And in his fourth regnal year, he went to Babylon himself, probably for the same purpose. And that's in chapters 29 and 51. It is possible, though purely conjectural, that this visit may have been connected with the dedication of the great image erected in the plain of Dura. It's from Siegfried so, Horn in the Bible commentary. Yeah, so it's Bible possible. Dictionary. Yeah, it's possible that there were two, one current and one former king of Judea that were out there bowing down. Mm. Mm. And there may have been a lot of others. And maybe a lot of others. I, I doubt that it was only four people that came from Judah. Judah. Yeah. There were probably others. In Daniel 6, we find another story in which Daniel was accused of worshiping his God and not worshiping the king. Now we're talking in the days of the Medo-Persian government. He was thrown into a den of lions where God protected him from the lions and his enemies. Amazingly, each of these stories turned out well. But even if they had not turned out well, those young men did what was right in the setting. Would we agree with that? Well, Nebuchadnezzar conquered the country of Judah and surrounded and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. It took three different invasions for that to happen. But as we know, the capital, Babylon, did not survive forever. Babylon was conquered by the Medes and Persians. Fortunately, King Cyrus had a different attitude toward the Jewish religion. He allowed all those who wanted to, to return home. Unfortunately, experts estimate that only 1-2% to 2 of the Jews ever returned home to their homeland. And I will just comment, some of you are aware already, that until the recent, until the current regime came to Iran, there were many, many Jews who still lived in Iran. Mm -hmm. This takes us to the setting where the story of Esther, our main story for today, takes place. So now, if you were in Babylon or you were within Susa, as it talks about here, and you decided to go back to Jerusalem, which way would you go? Which direction? Go west. Go west, yeah. Israel is quite a ways to the west. Okay. Um, while a few of the Jews were returning to their homeland and trying to reestablish a government where God was worshipped properly, 
Mordecai, probably as an employee of the government of Persia, moved east instead of west. He was in the city of Susa or Shushan in Persia. Now that's quite a ways further east even than Babylon. Okay, that is where a replacement was sought for Vashti, the deposed queen. So here's Jews that are still apparently worshiping faithfully, but which direction are they going? Why are they going east? Why are they going east? That's the question. The government job moved them. Okay, well, from Esther Hypothesis. 2, verses 1 to 9 through 9. Later, even after the king's anger had cooled down, he kept thinking about what Vashti had done and about his proclamation against her. So some of the king's advisors who were close to him suggested, why don't you make a search to find some beautiful young virgins? You can appoint officials in every province of the empire and order them to bring all these beautiful young women to your harem here in Susa, the capital city. Put them in the care of Haggai, Hag 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 the eunuch, who, was in charge of, who is in charge of your women. They have somebody in charge of the women. Mm -hmm. And let them be given a beauty treatment. Then take the young wo woman you like best and make her queen in Vashti's place. The king thought this was a good idea, so he followed it. There in Susa lived a Jew named Mordecai, son of Jar? Jair. Jair. He was from the tribe of Benjamin and was a descendant of Kish and Shim Shimei. Shimei. <clears throat> Do you know who, what other person was a descendant of Kish? Saul. King Saul. That's right. I knew I knew the name, but I, yeah. Okay, and I need to tell you a little bit more here just to fill in. What did God tell Saw, uh, saw King Saul to do with respect to a certain group of people? To kill, kill them all. Er eliminate them completely. And what group of people was that? The Amalekites. Okay, go ahead. Okay. When King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon took, the, took King Jehoiachin of Judah into exile from Jerusalem along with a group of captives, Mordecai was among them. He had a cousin, Esther, whose Hebrew name was Hadassah. She was a beautiful young woman and had a good figure. At her death, at the, <laughs> at the death of her parents, Mordecai had adopted her and brought her up as his own daughter. When the king had issued a, the, his new procl proclamation and many young women were brought from Susa, Esther was among them. She too was put in the royal pa palace in the care of Haggai, Haggai mm -hmm. who was in charge of the harem. Haggai liked Esther and she won his favor. He lost no time in beginning her beauty treatment of massage and a special diet. He gave her the best place in the harem and assigned seven young women a specially chosen from the royal palace to serve her. Wow. Good News Bible. Wow. So what do you suppose is in her special diet? Mm. Chocolates. <laughs> Does she think, do you think she has? and broccoli and uh, all sorts of bad stuff. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that she had any choice in her diet? No. Well, maybe. Maybe, maybe because she was, she was being Curried to, to be a queen. Yeah, and Haggai liked her. Yeah. Well, who advised King Ahasuerus, otherwise known as Xerxes? And I'm going to just tell you a crazy, crazy story. This king's name in Persian, Farsi, well, what we'd call Farsi today, is so unbelievable, diff, diff, in, unbelievably difficult to pronounce that I don't know anybody in any other language can manage to pronounce it. So what we have is either they have taken that name and tried to put it into Hebrew and in the, to Latin into English or into Greek and then into English. And Ahasuerus and Xerxes are exactly the same name. It just depends on which way did you go through Hebrew and Latin to English or did you go through Z Greek to English. 
It has you where it's an exist, and somewhere in between there is that crazy name, which was his real name. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, so Esther 1, 16 to 18, and here's the part that our Bible quarterly did not mention. The, then Memukan declared to the king and his officials, Queen Vashti is insulted, not only the king, but also his officials. In fact, every man in the empire, every woman in the empire will begin to look down on her husband as soon as she hears what the queen has done. They'll say King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to come to him, and she refused. When the wives of the royal officials of Persia and Media hear about the queen's behavior, they will be telling their husbands about it before the day is out. Wives everywhere will have no respect for their husbands, and husbands will be angry with their wives. Okay, ladies, you want to comment? <laughs> well, this is the patriarchal society for sure. Yes, that is for sure. <laughs> so, what do these words tell us about the attitude toward women in those days? Well, it is apparent from the context that Mordecai and Esther were faithfully practicing their Jewish, re their Jewish religion. However, they recognized that they were in a hostile environment. Look at these words of advice from Mordecai to Esther. Jim? Esther, chapter 2, verses 10 and 20. Now, on the advice of Mordecai, Esther had kept it secret that she was Jewish. As for Esther, she had still not let down, let it be known that she was Jewish. Mordecai had told her not to tell anyone, and she obeyed him in this, just as she had obeyed him when she was a little girl under his care. Good news Bible. Now, I have another question for you. The Persians, what general large uh, population group do they belong to? You know, they are Semites. Who else is a Semite? The Jews. The Jews are Semites also. Well, a lot of the, as you said earlier, a lot of the Persians are, are Jews. Well, they, they, they're literally Jews. Are they used, but uh, many, many of those Jews that used to live in Persia because of the way they've been treated recently have left and moved to Israel. That's part and of And other countries. And other countries, yeah. Are there ever times in our day when it might be wisest to keep quiet about our beliefs? Probably. Now we're going to get into mm -hmm. some challenging stuff, huh? Probably. We did not know exactly what position Mordecai held in the government. However, apparently he worked near the king's palace. The next main event in the story is found in Esther 3, 1 through 15. Jennifer? Esther chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Sometime later, King Xerxes promoted a man named Haman to the position of prime minister. Haman was the son of Hamadatha, a descendant of Agag, king of the Amalekites, Israel's enemies. So where these people weren't even supposed to exist anymore. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. The king ordered all the officials in his service to show their respect for Haman by kneeling and bowing to him. They all did so, except for Mordecai, who refused to do it. The other officials in the royal service asked him why he was disobeying the king's command. Day after day, they urged him to give in, but he would not listen to them. I am a Jew, he explained, and I cannot bow to Haman. So they, that seems to suggest that this animosity has something to do with the behavior, maybe. Or was it he can't bow to any human? Well, let's follow, keep reading. We'll see if we... So they told Haman about this, wondering if he would tolerate Mordecai's conduct. Haman was furious when he realized that Mordecai was not going to kneel and bow to him. And when he learned that Mordecai was a Jew, he decided to do more than punish Mordecai alone. He made plans to kill every Jew in the whole Persian Empire. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. In the twelfth year of King Xerxes' rule, in the first month, the month of Nisan, Haman ordered the lots to be cast, Purim they were called, yeah. to find out the right day and month to carry out his plot. The thirteenth day of the twelfth month, the month of Adar, was decided on. Okay, that is more or less equivalent to our 
end of February, beginning of March. So Haman told the king, there is a certain race of people scattered all over your empire and found in every province. They observe customs that are not like those of any other people. Moreover, they do not obey the laws of the empire. So it is not in your best interest to tolerate them. If it please, wow. <laughs> if it please your majesty, issue a decree that they are to be put to death. If you do, I guarantee that I will be able to put more than 340 tons of silver. Tons, that's tons. Oh, tons. Okay, 340 tons of silver into the royal treasury for the administration of the empire. Now, where do you think he intended to get his 340 tons of silver? From the Jews. From the Jews. From the Jews. Exactly. Okay. The king took off his ring, which was used to stamp proclamations and make them official, and gave it to the enemy of the Jewish people, Haman, son of Hamadatha, the descendant of Agag. The king told him, the people and their money are yours. Do as you like with them. So on the 13th day of the first month, Haman called the king's secretaries and dictated a proclamation to be translated into every language and system of writing used in the empire and to be sent to all the rulers, governors, and officials. It was issued in the name of King Xerxes and stamped with his ring. Runners took this proclamation to every province of the empire. It contained the instructions that on a single day, the 13th day of Adar, all Jews, young and old, women and children, were to be killed. Let me interrupt for just a second. What, did, what do you think they did in Jerusalem? I think people around them tried to take this opportunity to wipe out the Jews? Because a bunch of the Jews have gone home by this time. Mm -hmm. One or two percent. Mm -hmm. Okay, while you think about that, go ahead, Jennifer. They were to be slaughtered without mercy, and their belongings were to be taken. The contents of the proclamation were to be made public in every province, so that everyone would be prepared when that day came. At the king's command, the decree was made public in the capital city of Susa, and runners carried the news to the provinces. The king and Haman sat down and had a drink, while the city of Susa was being thrown into confusion. Wow. We're not told very specifically why Mordecai refused to bow down to Haman. However, we can guess. Haman was a descendant of Agag, the king of the Amalekites. The Amalekites were major enemies of Israelites from the time Israel left Egypt and continuing throughout their history. Of course, Mordecai may have refused to bow to him just because he served only God. Didn't Abraham have some uh, interaction with them too? Not that I'm aware. It's possible, maybe. Interaction with the Amalekites? Amalekites? Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong, but... Uh... Here's where the story becomes quite challenging. Gordon? From the writings of Ellen White, uh, from Adventists, Review, Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, 1860, 1884. In all ages, the people of God have been the light of the world. Joseph was a light in Egypt. From Daniel and his companions in Mordecai, a bright light shone amid the moral darkness of the kingly courts of Babylon and also Persia. In holy vision, God revealed to Daniel light and truth that he had concealed from other men. And through his chosen servant, this light has shone down through the ages and will continue to shine to the end of time. Okay. So God revealed, so Daniel was basically a prophet. Yes. God revealed to him stuff that he didn't reveal to other people, but that's what he has done to prophets. Yes. Yeah. He was also a lot of other things, Daniel yeah. was, but yes. Okay. You want to go ahead, or Myra? Myra, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, okay. From the Bible study guide. When Haman wanted to destroy the Jewish people, describing them as a certain people dispersed among the peoples of all the provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate, their customs are different from all those of other from all other people, and they do not obey the king's laws. That's from Esther three eight. A people 
whose customs that are different and do not obey the king's law, laws, such as the perfect recipe for persecution. Mm -hmm. From our Bible study guide. <clears throat> December 19. Do you suppose that a time could come not too far in the future when we will be tested like that? <clears throat> yes. Mm -hmm. What happened next is found in Esther 4. We're following the story along start bit by bit. When Mordecai learned of all that had been t done, he tore his clothes in anguish. Then he dressed in sackcloth, covered his head with ashes, and walked to the city wailing loudly and bitterly. I don't know. That would be quite a thing to see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just, until he came to the entrance of the palace. He did not go in because no one wearing sackcloth was allowed inside. Throughout all the provinces, wherever the king's proclamation was made known, there was loud mourning among the Jews. They fasted, wept, and wailed, and most of them put on sackcloth and lay in ashes. So this proclamation was made, what, something like nine months before it was to be carried out. So you have nine months to think about your doomsday. Mm -hmm. Nine months to get out of the country. Yeah, okay. When Esther's young women and eunuchs told her what Mordecai was doing, she was deeply disturbed. She sent Mordecai some clothes to put on instead of the sackcloth, but he would not accept them. <laughs> then she called Hethak, one of the palace eunuchs appointed as her servant by the king, and told him to go to Mordecai and find out what was happening and why Hathak, and why. Hathak went to Mordecai in the city square at the entrance of the palace. Mordecai had told him everything that had happened to him and just how much money Haman had promised to put into the royal treasury if all the Jews were killed. Wow. He gave Hathak, Hathak a copy of the proclamation that had been issued in Susa, ordering the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai asked him to take it to Esther, explain the situation to her, and ask her to go and plead with the king and beg him to have mercy on her people. Okay. Hathak did this, and Esther gave him this message to take back to Mordecai. If anyone, man or woman, goes to the inner courtyard and sees the king without being summoned, that person must die. Why do you suppose there was a rule like that? So people wouldn't just charge in and... Nobody could do the Elisha thing? Yeah. <laughs> charge in and kill the king? Okay. It wasn't just Elisha that did that. It was... Elijah. Elijah. It was the guy that was the left The guy with the knife. Yeah. Uh, what was his name? Oh, I can't remember right now. It's in Judges. The guy that was left-handed and they... No one was left-handed, so they didn't suspect him of having a sword. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, that is the law. Everyone from the king's advisors to the people in the provinces knows that. Wow. There's only one way to get around this law. If the king holds out his gold scepter to someone, then that person's life is spared. But, if it, but, but it has been a month since the king sent for me. Hmm. When Mordecai received Esther's message, he sent her the, this warning. Don't imagine that you are safer than any other Jew because, just because you're in the royal palace. If you keep quiet at a time like this, help will come from heaven to the Jews and they will be saved. But you will die and your father's family will come to an end. Yet who knows, maybe it was for a time like this that you were made queen. Mm -hmm. Good news Bible. Okay, given all that you know about the story, if she had kept quiet, do you think Esther could have, been, could have survived without revealing that she was Jewish? Given Haman's event, I'm not sure. Didn't they, you know, isn't it obvious to people, where did you come from, Queen Esther? Oh, Mordecai, you know, and they know Mordecai is Jewish. Mm-hmm, yeah. If you look at carvings and, and things like that, that from on, on carved in, in granite or, or marble and so forth from that time, you can tell where they came from based on their hairstyle and uh, their dress, partially their dress and so forth. They will tell you 
okay, that one's from this and that's from. Hmm. So I don't know. That of course, could change. Huh? That the hairstyle and, and dress could change. And it's possible that Esther had been completely redressed as that's a right. as a Persian because she was supposed to be queen. But um, anyway. She probably knew that once she got involved, she was putting her life on the line. However, following three days of praying and fasting, she was, remember, I put, see, notice that I put in there praying. Does it say that in the text? No. <laughs> she was willing to approach the king. Okay? That's mine, I guess. Esther 5, 1 and 2. On the third day of her fast, Esther put on her royal robes and went and stood in the inner courtyard of the palace, facing the throne room. The king was inside, seated on the royal throne, facing the entrance. When the king saw Queen Esther standing outside, she won his favor, and he held out to her the gold scepter. She then came up and touched the tip of it. Mm. Okay. Jennifer, do you do that to your husband? <laughs> <laughs> no. Or Myra, maybe. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> okay. So Esther 9, 1 to 2, see the results of what happened. Jim? Uh, Esther ch chapter 9, verses 1 to 12. The thirteenth day of Adar came, the day on which er the royal proclamation was to take effect, the day when the enemies of the Jews were hoping to get them in their power, but instead the Jews triumph triumphed over them. In the Jewish quarter of every city in the empire, the Jews organized themselves to attack anyone who tried to harm them. People everywhere were afraid of them, and no one could stand against them. In fact, all the provincial office officials, governors, administrators, and royal representatives helped the Jews because they were all afraid of Mordecai. Now, what do you suppose that means? What it's, a great reason to have someone on your side because you're, they're afraid of you. Keep your enemies close, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was well known throughout the empire that Mordecai was now a powerful man in the palace and was growing more powerful. So the Jews could not could do what they wanted with their enemies. They attacked them with swords and slaughtered them. In Susa, the capital city itself, the Jew, Jews killed 500 people. Among them were the ten sons of Haman, son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. Parshadatha, Delphon, Delphon, Aspatha, Paratha, Adelia, Arid, Aridatha, Parmishid, anyway, all of those scrambled names. Okay. However, there was no looting. The same day. What, what's the meaning of however there was no looting? Well, in other words, the, the idea wasn't, okay, now the Jews have, have killed their enemies because what they're really trying to do is get their money. So he said, no, that's not what this is about. This is about re re preservation. Preservation, yeah. Okay, Jim. That same day, the number of people killed in Susa was reported to the king. He then said to Queen Esther, In Susa alone, the Jews have killed 500 people, including Haman's 10 sons. What must they have done to, what must they have done out in the provinces? What do you think? You th shall have it. What do you want? What do you want now? What do you want now? You shall have it. Tell me what else you want and you shall have it. Good news, Bible. Wow. We are introduced at this point to the idea that it was a miracle of God to protect the Jewish people. Do you think that, uh, that what happened was a miracle of God rescuing the Jewish nation? Or was this just a natural occurrence? Well, these are tough would, questions, huh? Yeah, I would hope that Mordecai was a close friend of God and became powerful because of well god helped him kill his enemies huh uh, i don't know about that part well the government officials were helping them kill their enemies that's what it says we just read it because they were scared of haman i mean of, of scared of haman or yeah, scared of mordecai, mordecai. mordecai. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah well uh, the, the story seems to imply that that mordecai took haman's place 
Mm. And I guess just as ruthless, huh? Well, let's hope not. There was something very interesting that happened as a result of all of that. Jennifer? From Esther chapter 8, verses 17. In every city and province, wherever the king's proclamation was read, the Jews held a joyful holiday with feasting and happiness. In fact, many other people became Jews because they were afraid of them now. From the Good News Bible. That's evangelism. Uh, is that a good way to recruit new members? <laughs> Great evangelistic campaign. I'll become a Jew because I'm afraid of you. <laughs> like they, they converted it to Catholicism in what the, during the Spanish Revolution or something over, over there. Position. You know, <laughs> go along to get along. Well, how, how about the uh, the Muslim hordes that went through? Mm -hmm. it, it, uh, <laughs> Okay, Jews still celebrate the story of Esther by reading the book of Esther every year during the Purim festivities. Okay. The Bible study guide challenge. Pray that God will give you the courage to share something he has done for you with one of the people on your prayer list this week. And okay. challenge up or secondary challenge or even more challenging. Begin a diary or journal of special little things or big things that God does for you. Review it and pray that God will bring these things to your mind at just the right time so you can share them with someone from the Bible study guide for Thursday. Okay. So now, what should we as Christians living in the 21st century do with this story? Well, Mrs. White says, to every household and every school, to every parent, teacher, and child upon whom has shown the light of the gospel, comes the crisis, the question put to Esther, the queen, at the momentous crisis in is Israel's history. Who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Esther 4.14. So what do you think she's implying by those comments? Uh, that Esther... No, I'm talking about us. What is she saying to us? Every parent, every teacher, every child? I don't know. I don't think I'd want to put my girls in that position. Well, what? No, no I, she's not asking us to... She's saying... Every one of us should be prepared to stand up and witness. That's what she's saying. Okay. How are we prepared to do that? Are we prepared to make people fearful of us? Yeah. I hope that's Went not... Through intimidation. I hope that's not what she was implying. She doesn't say that. No, I, I don't think that's what she meant, but no. you know, it could be, could be taken that way. Well, Esther was a beautiful Jewish girl, cousin of Mordecai, who took her into his home after her parents died and loved her as his own daughter. God used her to save the Jewish people in the land of Persia. I think we have to say that seems to be true. In ancient times, the Lord worked in a wonderful way through consecrated women who united in his work with men whom he had chosen to stand as his representatives. He used women to gain great and decisive victories. Okay, all you biblical scholars, name a time when he used women to accomplish a great victory. Deborah. Deborah. Barak. Barak. Barak wouldn't. Barak would not. Barak would army. not go into into battle without. And she was a prophet. Mm. You know, also as a, a judge, technically. Okay. More than once in times of emergency, he brought them to the front and worked through them for the salvation of many lives. Through Esther the Queen, the Lord accomplished a mighty deliverance for his people at a time when it seemed that no power could save them. Esther and the women associated with her by fasting and prayer and prompt action met the issue and brought salvation to their people. Yes. So do you think this was the devil's attempt way before Jesus came to wipe out the Jews so Jesus can't come in the line of David? Exactly. Yeah. He's that devious? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Just wanted to hear you say it. Yeah, no, I think there's no question about that. And you it, think that's what's behind this story? Yes, I'm sure. And that's why God had 
Mordecai and us to move east as opposed to west? Well, you know, I look at these stories, and I'm sure you probably do too, and I, I, I ask myself, okay, what if this thing was a little different? What if that was a little different? What if this was a little different? You know, what if Mordecai had, what if Esther had not been beautiful? Yeah. What if Mordecai had not had that particular kind of job? Would they have been in Jerusalem instead of Susa? Uh, and there wouldn't have been the issue of not bowing down to him. I mean, and, and what if Haman had never been appointed to that job? I mean, there's a lot of what ifs that you, can, you could potentially think of. Those are just a few choices. A study of women's work in connection with the cause of God in the Old Testament times will teach us lessons that will enable us to meet emergencies in the work today. And I will tell you, uh, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with some of these stories, there are times in certain kinds of societies in our world today that women can evangelize and men can't. There Why was a that? time, huh? Why is that? Well, because women are able to go out and say things and people say, well, she's just a woman. We, and she's not going to do anything. She's not going to say anything that's going to cause any problems. And Ellen White specifically speaks about the time in Sweden in the book Great Controversy when adults were not allowed to get, pre the preach the message, so children started preaching the message. Mm. It's right there. So you so, don't have to be 30 years old to do it, huh? You don't. We may not be brought into such a critical and prominent place. And uh, another example of that, in that same book, is the guy who started, says, I, I can't, I'm not allowed to preach to the adults. So he started a school. And he started teaching the kids, and the kids went home and talked to their parents, and the parents started coming and said, tell us what you're talking about. <laughs> he started a great reformation by talking to the kids. We may not be brought into such a critical and prominent place as were the people of God in the time of Esther, but often converted women can act as important, an important part in more humble positions. This, thus, this many have been doing and are still ready to do. From the book, Daughters of God, ladies, take a notice, pages 45 and 46. This lesson raises several very challenging questions. From the Bible study guide, Jim. The book of Esther does leave us with some unanswered questions, particularly concerning Esther's role in the court of the king, even though she was elevated to the role of queen. How do we reconcile these things with her faith, or can we? Should faithful Jewish girls get married to pagan kings? Okay, no. again, what? No. <laughs> so again, I mean, we don't know what she said to the people who said, okay, you come with us. We have no information about that. We have no information about what she did when she was in the king's palace, when she, would be, she was being prepared, or when she even met the king. We don't know. We just don't know any of those things. Who was the virtuous woman here, the virtuous queen? Was it Esther or Vashti? Well, I am quite sure that if the same thing had happened to Esther, she would have done the same thing that Vashti did. So, mm, yeah. don't you think? I don't know. Okay, go ahead, Jim. The words of Esther, and if I perish, I perish. Esther 4.16, New King James Version have echoed down through the millennia as an example of faithfulness even in the face of death. How do her words reflect what God's people will face in the last days when the issues in Revelation 13 become a reality? This from the Bible study guide for Friday. Okay, December. specifically Revelation 13 says what? Every person, every tribe, every language, whatever, will worship the devil except those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Basically, it says two times there in Re mm -hmm. Revelation 13. Yeah, exactly. So, what kind of pressures are going to come at that point? Big pressure. Strong pressure. Big pressure. Okay, 
Jennifer? I'm from the Bible Study Guide. The book of Esther is unique for several reasons. One of those reasons is the lack of an explicit reference to God. Nowhere is God mentioned in the entire narrative's sequence, not by the Jewish characters, the story's heroes, nor by the non-Jewish characters. And yet, despite this oddity, the book contains valuable wisdom for those who follow Jesus and desire to share their experience with God in a world where many are not open to explicit expressions of faith. Okay, I'm going to interrupt again. What are the things we're ta they're talking about here? What things, I mean, we're not, we're not going to try to follow all the things that Esther did or all the things that Mordecai did, for that matter. How do we sort out what's good and what's bad? Is it just the courage of Esther? That's what we want to, what we want to learn here? Or what do we want to learn here? And why isn't God's name mentioned? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is the, I mean, there's so many opportunities to that. Okay. Now, I will tell you, that if you read a Ro if you get a Roman Catholic Bible, you will find out that there's woven in the middle of the Book of Esther. There's a bunch of additions to the Book of Esther, which have all that in there. All, he, all that, all the references to God. Well, number of references to God and and people praying to God and all that kind of stuff. It's all there. Where did this come from? Hmm? Where did this come from? Editing no, or what? Editing or no, this came from uh, whatever you want to call it. This came the first place I think that it was that it ever appeared was in some of the Latin translations. So this is from Hebrew to Greek to Latin, and someone in the process of going from Greek to Latin apparently added this material, and it's it's in it's in the Latin Bibles. It's in the Catholic Bibles. It's not in not in Protestant Bibles. Mm. So maybe we should be reading the Catholic Bible here. Is it wrong to mention God's name here in some of these stories? Is it wrong to add to the Bible? <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, the challenge in a case like that is uh, we can clearly find older documents that don't have those extra pieces in them. And that's the basis on which Protestant, by and large, reject those parts. There's no Greek, there's no Hebrew for, the, for that material, okay? So we're pretty sure it wasn't in the original. The question is, how did it get in? Who thought it was all right for them to add or modify the Bible? Who thought it was right to put in about the Pool of Bethsaida that the angel stirred the water so that the first one in to the pool would be healed. I mean, that's not there in the original. No, it isn't. Same, same kind of thing. We're explaining things. Yeah. Sometimes we get the wrong explanation. Well, in the, in the case of the pool of Bethesda, actually it should have been Bethesda, but in case of that story, it's hard to understand what's, what happens later without that piece of information. It would be nice if they had left it in the margin so you could, oh, that's why. But someone thought, okay, we'd, why leave it in the margin? Let's put it in the text. Mm. Okay. Often, well, go ahead. Well, there is something to be said for uh, Esther not saying she was Jewish. Mm -hmm. And her, her uh, ability to bring those around her, they liked her. Mm -hmm. And they did all these things for her because of the way she acted in a, you know, I, I would have to say it's an, an example rather than preaching. Okay, okay, now I'm going to bring a little extra material into this story. I didn't know whether we'd have time to talk about this. If you look at the strict Persian records, there's no trace of anyone by the name of Esther or anyone who could possibly have been Esther. No Hadassah. No Hadassah in the records, none. And there's, there's, there's stories of the kings down through the line like that, and King Xerxes is mentioned, but there's no mention of, e I don't think, either Bashti or Esther. Why? And the question is, 
I mean, she was a very healthy young woman. Did she have children? And what happened to them? A lot of healthy young women don't have children. Some don't. Mm -hmm. Do the Persian um, writings mention other women? Yeah, some. Oh, they do? Yeah. Because those, maybe yeah. they don't. Maybe that's the key, some. Mm -hmm. There are some that are mentioned. and Yeah. The ones that, Boys. you know, maybe shed bad light on the king, yeah, like Vashti. Vashti. We're not going to mention those. Yeah. Yeah, the ones that shed, shed maybe well, they, light on the and Jews, and of course, we're not going to mention those. Of course, the question there is who has the right to say, okay, this is what we'll put in, this is what we won't put in. I mean, that's, those, are the, those, are this, those are the things you struggle with, and you do some of this translation anyway. Often when people in the church think about or discuss mission, they focus on the explicit faith-oriented actions, such as evangelistic meetings, distribution of faith-based literature, Bible studies, and other forms of outreach. These things require a certain level of freedom and connection to community to foster any meaningful transformation. But what about places where government doesn't allow faith-based activities? What about areas where people are entirely <coughs> uninterested in such activities? Often the church ignores such settings, but places that fit this description make up a substantial portion of the world's population. Can you think of some specific areas? Just to mention a couple of nations real quick. Yes. Would you like to name I them? Or? I want to mention them out loud. Okay. <laughs> yeah, clearly we can think of a number of them in certain parts of the world, can't we? Often the church ignores such settings, but places that fit this description and I, I just have to stop and tell you a story. Uh, in a certain nation, I won't mention the name, it's absolutely forbidden to try to evangelize, to, to change this, the people in that religion to Christians. And an Adventist gentleman who was a diesel mechanic, a, a large di engine diesel mechanic, worked for the American embassy in that country. Was the, he and his family were there. And of course, he had access to the pouch where the American mail goes back and forth, and so nobody, and that's, that's diplomatic stuff, so nobody could touch it. So how do, how do you do something to try to teach about God in that setting? What they did is they ordered a whole bunch of Adventist, colorful Adventist magazines. And every year, every, no, every week, as they put their trash out, they would put the trash out, fill it full of junk, but on the very top, they would put these Adventist magazines. And none of the Adventist magazines ever got to the, to the dump. <laughs> Nobody could accuse them of doing anything wrong, but, and that was a, that's, that's a perfect example of something you could do in this kind of a setting. Mm -hmm. Creativity. Mm -hmm. Okay, this week, through the lens of Esther Mordecai, we will see that God desires us to be creative in our witness even in places and spaces that are not open to overt mission work. Jim? They took the stand in a context in which they were part of a minority group, underappreciated in the empire, yet through God's influence and the willingness of Esther and Mordecai to make wise decisions in connection with God's overall plan to, for humanity. The queen and her adoptive father were able to be a blessing to people and to be part of a moment in history that was passed down via the pages of the Bible and the practice of the Festival of Purim. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so now, uh, Jennifer, moving the rest of the story. In Esther chapter 9, verses 18 to 32. The Jews of Susa, however, made the 15th made the 15th a holiday, since they had slaughtered their enemies on the 13th and 14th, and then stopped on the 15th. This is why Jewish Jews who live in small towns observe the 14th day of the month of Adar as a joyous holiday, a time for feasting and giving gifts of food to one another. Okay, so if you lived in a place where the killing all, all took place in one day, then you celebrate the 14th the next day. But if you live in a place where the killing took two days, then you <coughs> celebrate after two days. <laughs> okay. Okay, then Mordecai had these events written down and sent letters to all the Jews, near and far throughout the Persian Empire, telling them to observe the 14th and 15th days of Adar as holidays every year. 
These were the days on which the Jews had rid themselves of their enemies. This was a month that had been turned from a time of grief and despair into a time of joy and happiness. They were told to observe these days with feasts and parties, giving gifts of food to one another and to the poor. So the Jews followed Mordecai's instructions and the celebration became an annual custom. I think that's still followed today. Isn't yes, it is, absolutely. I, I said to you, they have five major holidays and there's a portion of Bible, entire sections of the Bible read connection with each one of those holidays. And of course, this time they, re they read the book of Esther on this occasion. Okay, go ahead. Haman, son of Hamadatha, the descendant of Agag and the enemy of the Jewish people, had cast lots, or Purim, as they were called, to determine the day for destroying the Jews. He had planned to wipe them out. But Esther went to the king, and the king issued written orders with the result that Haman suffered the fate he had planned for the Jews. He and his sons were hanged from the gallows. That is why the holidays are called Purim. Because of Mordecai, Mordecai's letter and because of all that had happened to them, the Jews made it a rule for themselves, their descendants, and anyone who might become a Jew, that all the proper time each year, these two days would be regularly observed according to Mordecai's instructions. It was resolved that every Jewish family of every future nation in every province and every city should remember and observe the days of Purim for all time to come. Okay, is there anything equivalent to that for Christians? Hmm. Okay, uh, we have time to read a maybe a couple more verses there. Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abba, Abihail, along with Mordecai, also wrote a letter putting her full authority behind the letter about Purim, which Mordecai had written earlier. The letter was addressed to all the Jews and copies were sent to all the 127 provinces of the Persian Empire. It wished that Jews peace and security and directed them and their descendants to observe the days of Purim at the proper time, just as they had adopted rules for the observance of fasts and times of mourning. This was commanded by both Mordecai and Queen Esther. Esther's command confirming the rules for Purim was written down on a scroll. Okay, and just uh, it's time to close there. Well, we'll have a moment. Where do you think Christians are more committed to the truth? People who live where it is easy to speak to others about God or peace, people who speak about God in times of persecution? Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, these stories, even though they're from ancient times, make us think seriously about what we know is coming, which has been prophesied very clearly in the book of Revelation and in other areas of the Bible. Help us to have the courage that Esther and Mordecai had, and may the results be some, some, somewhat similar as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.